All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks. Thanks for coming on this, being inside with me. I think most of you are inside on a beautiful sunny afternoon. So how to use a checklist to maximize learning. Um, and it's really, as I said, more properly called use a checklist. Use a checklist to maximize learning. Okay. So I, I wanted to kind of contextualize why we put a teaching talk in a professional development certificate um, series. I, we like to think about professional development as the Venn diagram between authenticity, like doing work that's true to yourself, to your personality, to your values, and also try to do work or be in a place where you do work that's impactful and having a positive effect on a situation or a person. So this really is the heart of general internal medicine. And I think Gitanjali talked a lot about this in her uh, grand rounds, wasn't last week or the week before. And I, I think teaching falls really nicely into the middle of this Venn diagram. For I would I would think for almost all of us, um, whether you're a physician scientist or a full-time clinical faculty or whatever the new track is, um, I think it's a core part of professional development. That's why we're doing this topic today. I wanted to plug the clinical teaching certificate program. I know many of you have done this. Have, has anyone done done this actually? I know many of you are enrolled. So Amy, uh, Julia, Katie, yeah, definitely. I remember Katie in the series. So if you haven't done it, Lindsay teaches in it. So Lindsay is familiar as well. Um, I would really plug this as another way that you can build these skills. And I just copied and pasted 10 minutes ago some of the feedback. I like to go back and look. It's like good morale boost to go see how much people liked it. People really like it and it's helpful. So um, you can just go to climb.edu, climb.washington.edu and enroll if you're interested. So objectives for the rest of our time. We heard a lot of this already. So I think you're already doing this. So I want to reinforce that. Prioritize a positive learning climate to maximize learning. Positive learning climate and psychological safety turns out are critical and necessary to be an effective teacher and for any learning to occur. Consider seven themes of excellent clinical teaching. And I'm gonna go through this talk. The structure is I'm gonna go through those seven themes and I'm gonna present, I think five or six checklist items that will fit into those themes as we go. And then finally, the last objective here is an aspirational objective. So at the end of this talk, I'm going to ask you all to go around and tell me one new thing that you want to try, just one thing you want to do differently um, when you're teaching next time you teach. All right, so we like to be evidence-based, um, certainly in medicine and also in medical education. Um, it can be challenging to do that. I mean, I, I know many of you write and read the medical education literature. But the problem in making some sort of sense out of what's published is that the teachers are all different, the teaching methods are all different, the content's all different, context is all different, the learners are all different, everything's different. And then, so they do some sort of intervention and they measure some sort of outcome, the outcomes are all different, the measurements are all different. So how do you figure out by looking at the medical education literature well, what are these best practices or these better practices? What are these checklist items? So the way I like to think about it is that it actually is a bit of a sophisticated way of putting together multiple sources of data. So part of it is evidence from research, and that's one of the elements. Part of it is, I, I would say that your feedback that you've gotten from learners, that's important to think about. Um, your reflections, your own experiences. I think societal changes and influences are really important to think about as you think about best practices and the checklist. You know, when I trained and even, you know, early attending career, we didn't think about diversity and inclusion and equity as elements in education, or at least I didn't. It wasn't top of my consciousness, but over the years that's emerged. Um, similarly, I used to have a highly behavioral focus and now I'm much more about the learning climate. So there's gonna be evolution in how you think about this checklist and best practices. And then finally, frameworks and mental models, I think are really important. And I'm gonna share one of those with you here um, next. 
So first, here's the checklist. So here's the here here are the five things that I think you should think about and have emerged from my own funnel of data and experience and other elements. Being kind. Those of you who know Addie McClintock or attended the teaching certificate series, this is a point from her in her learning climate talk. And actually, I'm going to reference her talk a couple more times here. So support a positive learning environment, support psychological safety. That's probably the one thing that you can do that's going to be most effective for learning. Address racism and bias before, during, and after. Um, and I'll kind of frame that out for you. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The third checklist item is probably the hardest thing to do, which is to ask someone to watch you teach at least once. Uh, raise your hand if you've had someone observe and give you peer feedback on your teaching. Katie, Lindsay, Hermias. All right, almost everybody. Awesome, that's great. Um, and so I'm going to make a case for that and really encourage you to do that at least once. In fact, I'll offer to do that. If you email me, I, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, reinforcing the take home point, I think that actually aligns directly with the succinct teaching points. I think, was that, who was that? I can't remember now. Uh, Julia, thank you. So, yeah, I think being succinct and reinforcing the take home uh, point is going to be an important checklist item. And then finally, setting the stage for feedback. And we heard that from Katie and other folks as well that. Setting the stage, setting expectations, and doing that every time is really important. Okay, so this is a framework that we're going to go through in the next 40, 50 minutes. 40 minutes. Can't do the math. We're going to end by one, I promise. Control session. So that's control session. Let's skip to number two. Control session has to do with saying if you're going to do something within a certain amount of time to complete it within a certain amount of time. Learning climate, we've already talked about, and we're going to spend some more time chatting about that. Communication of goals is making sure that the learners know what it is that they're supposed to be taking away. Promotion of understanding and retention refers to what I thought was teaching. I used to think that it was all about explaining stuff, but it turns out there's all these other elements that are mo more important for learning. But that's like, are you organized? Are you presenting things in a way that's easy to understand? Evaluation and feedback has to do with, as I'm talking to you now, do I have any sense that you are retaining or understanding what I'm talking about? So that's kind of the evaluation piece. And feedback is if someone, if I'm able to evaluate and someone um, displays a misunderstanding of what I'm saying, am I able to say, that's actually incorrect. That's not what I was saying. Let me, let's, uh, let me explain it again. Um, and promotion of self-directed learning, I think, is a very interesting concept. This has to do with the idea that most of the learning that we're going to do and that we do now and that you're demonstrating now by being here is self-motivated, self-directed. You reach out and try to learn things that you don't know about to help you do your job. And are we promoting that in our learners so that they are able to continue to, to do that moving forward? So this is a Stanford Faculty Development Program framework. This is based on, um, I guess, over 50 years of research now, over 50 years of research, surveys, observations, um, lots of different ways that folks have uh, brought forth these elements as being the most important for learning. And there's a lot of evidence that supports um, these concepts. So this is not; these are not randomized controlled trials. But this is a big body of evidence that supports the validity of this framework. I'm not going to say more than that, but I just wanted to make the case that they're not made up, as I used to think. You know, it's like someone made a list. No, there's a lot more to it than that. Okay, so let's get started with learning climate. This has to do with the tone of the teaching setting. Is it stimulating? Are learners comfortable identifying their limitations? Do they feel safe? Is it a safe place to be yourself? Are they more focused on their image or on what they're trying to learn? So just a quick explanation of why this is so important. Turns out that the learning climate, and this is from Addie's, it's actually published now, um, Addie's paper on learning climate. So in a positive learning climate, the cognitive load um, feels lighter. 
So it's a lower cognitive load. You can focus on learning instead of on your image. And you're able to engage with the content and with the learner and with the teacher instead of withdrawing. And I think these concepts are actually applicable to the teachers and to the learners. Like if right now I felt like um, I'm really worried how I'm gonna come across, uh, you know, what if I get something wrong? I really don't wanna get something wrong. That's gonna be not, it's not a psychologically safe place for me to be teaching. And I think conversely, if you felt the same way, it would be hard for you to engage and try to get from this session what you, what you can. Um, and then finally, the last line there is in a positive learning clim climate, you disclose your gaps, whereas in a negative learning climate, folks will hide their areas of growth because they don't want to appear um, like they're not fully competent. So I wanted to share one study here that learning climate and psychological safety is really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to learning. It's not just learning that these things affect so this was a big study done a few years ago, um, actually just in 2021, 14,000 medical students, 140 medical schools. They surveyed all the students at, on year two and at graduation. And then they, they asked them about mistreatment at the beginning of year two, and they asked them about positive experiences at the beginning of year two. So I, I know I summarized the results here, but I just want to show it to you graphically here. So let me click on the laser pointer. Okay, so this is frequency of mistreatment reported by year two. These are the number of people that said never, once, and more than once. And if they had more than one instance of mistreatment, their exhaustion score was significantly higher in year four. So by year two, if they had more than one instance of mistreatment, at the end of year four, their exhaustion score was much higher. So these are profound things that happen to our learners. And so it's really important, and this is why I'm making the case, it's really important to be attuned to learning climate and psych psychological safety. Same thing with the disengagement score in year four. More than one episode or instance of mistreatment, significantly higher disengagement, and then career choice regret. Yeah, that's a pretty big difference at the end of year four, if there's more than one um, episode of mistreatment. And so this was a national first checkbox item. Be kind, you know, it's, uh, I know it's super intuitive to a lot of folks. I promise you, it's not super intuitive to me. It's something I've had to work on. When I first started as an attending, this was far from my mind that, oh, I need to be nice. That's not really something that I thought about. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna skip this, it's a little bit more data. I think we're on board here. I don't think I need to really prove that it's important to be kind. Um, so I'm gonna skip that, but well, I'm gonna show you a few more slides that look like this that give you some data for some of the other points that I'm gonna make moving forward. So some of the things to think about on this checklist item that I grappled with a lot and still do, are you repeating things that were done to you? Um, I did a lot of that at the beginning when I started as an attending. I kind of, you know, the things that happen to you that are harder, that make you feel um, maybe psychologically unsafe or makes it feel like a negative learning climate, those are stickier. And there's a human tendency to repeat the things that you remember. So that's something to reflect on. Are you taking things personally when it's actually a learner that's struggling? And, you know, I remember when I was at UCSF, there was a resident that seemed to avoid harder patient care situations and would kind of disappear. And I was like, they're just dumping their work on me, but they weren't dumping their work on me. They were trying to do their best um, and they were struggling. And so that's one another way to think about kindness. And then the other one that I like to think about a lot is, you know, I used to like launch into like, oh, where, where are you joining us from? Or what are you doing? What track are you in? You know, like basically interrogating the, the student or the resident before sharing something about myself. So that's kind of been like one of my personal be kind moments is like, don't ask a bunch of things about someone until you actually share something about yourself first. So those are my be kind 
kind of reflections. I would love to hear um, from other folks reflections on being kind. What are things that you do or that you've seen or that you've experienced that can really help reinforce this concept with all of us? I think that um, this concept of um, like imposterism and just remembering that like everybody has some degree of imposterism and um, even if it's small or very large, that if you are just erring on the side of assuming that everyone has imposterism and giving um, positive affirmation in really any way and being kind of overly giving of it is never going to be a bad thing. Um, and that's something that, you know, talking about unnatural, that's not always my instinct to just like see someone do something good and immediately praise it, even if it's like, quote unquote, basic. But I think no one is ever going to be upset if you give them praise that they, even if they don't necessarily feel that it's founded. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Luke. I love that. Yeah, I've, I've been surprised by folks who will share with me about their imposter syndrome. And I'm kind of like, what? I mean, I can't believe that you at your stage still have these feelings. Um, other thoughts on kindness? Just echoing that working in kind of a service environment where a lot of the feedback we're getting from patients or nurses or different folks can be critical at times. I think um, the proportion of a good feedback we give trainees is pretty helpful because we, we can actually control that, whereas we can't control all the other folks that they see within a day. Great, thanks, Lindsay. Well, one more thought, and then we'll keep going. I think if, when we ask the questions, if we are um, making contact with one person and you know, stay long with a pause, that can make the learner uncomfortable. So it's maybe better to ask your questions, just general, and then look all around the group, and then shorten the pause for giving the answer. Yeah, so uh, a lot of learners, especially if you're, they're like, all right, you're working with Hermias tonight, he's on nights, and then they don't know you, they don't know that the positive learning climate that you create, but if you start out by saying, all right, what's... Let's, let me ask you a question that may not feel as good as asking the group. So great. Yeah, I, mean, I think that exemplifies being kind to that person. So yeah, thank you. All right. So be kind is our number one checklist item. I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is addressing racism and bias. And I will, um, well, first I'm going to turn the laser pointer off so it doesn't keep showing up when I move my mouse. Um, I will I will tell you that I'm not an expert in this field at all, but I think it's one of my core values is to address racism, racism and bias. And I think it's important for folks who aren't experts to talk about this. So that's why I'm going to talk about it, even though I'm not like someone who has had training or anything special um, around racism and bias, but I'm just going to share some thoughts about it. Um, so I, I think of it as a before, during, and after addressing a racism and bias. And I, I'm sure many of you do this. So it's an opportunity to think about maybe if you already do it, think about how you might teach it to your learners, to your residents or your interns, um, or however you can make this piece helpful. So the before stage, oops, is like I said, too many folks that I, I should credit for teaching me this stuff, but I'm just going to plow ahead um, with you all knowing that I didn't make it up. <laughs> I learned it from someone else. So the before stage is with your, your learners before a day in clinic, before a rotation, before whatever it is to say something like, I want to make sure that we talk about you know how we want to address racism and bias, uh, if it should happen today in the patient room or in some other context. This is something I discuss with everyone. And so that's important. You can't just pick the learners that you think might be recipients of racism and bias. You gotta do this with everyone. 
You never really know when it's going to show up. And so what I say is, this is a direct quote, my philosophy is humans come first. You know, the UW medicine philosophy is patients come first. And I say, I don't really believe that. Humans come first. Um, patients are humans. We all come first. Learners are humans. And I want to make sure I do what I can do to uphold your dignity um, in these situations. And then I think the next step is important. It's like to hear what their perspective is. What are your thoughts on what we should do? And however we, we end up responding, it would be great if we can debrief, if that feels like it's appropriate and you're up for that. So some of the things that we talk about are, well, you know, if someone says something that's racist or biased or, you know, microaggression, you can leave. Like you are empowered to leave if you, if you need to. Um, and you can say, when I come back, we're gonna just focus on your care. You can redirect and proceed, like, let's just focus on your care. In other words, you can say something, you can interrupt it. Um, you can educate them if that's what you wanna do. You can call me, I'm happy to come in and talk to them. Or not on this bullet list, but also acceptable is you can ignore it. If you get this kind of stuff all the time and you just can't deal with it, it's fine to ignore it, whatever that feels right to you. So we have that conversation. Uh, and by the way, I don't always do this either. That's something I got to work on. Um, it's easy for me to have this conversation when I'm ward attending and with my college students. It's harder for me to have this conversation when I'm working with a resident in pre-op clinic for a day and I'm already trying to like talk about processes and we're only going to see each other that one day. And so that's the area where I need to make a point to I still got to do this because it's important. Um, okay, and so during... So you've already kind of talked about what your plan is gonna be. It's like, yes, patients do come first if there is something that they need medically. So yeah, don't stop chest compressions and walk, walk out. You do have to make sure the patient is safe and then carry out whatever plan that you made. And then the last piece is, um, you know, don't make any assumptions about what how it was for the learner. Don't assume that because they said, oh yeah, we should debrief. They still want to debrief. You don't necessarily, um, I mean, you always want to ask what feels right for them in that situation. Debriefing is generally good. And then learn about what you could have done better. Um, I'll tell you, I've been in situations as an attending where I didn't have this conversation with the resident. And a patient actually said something to me, which was racist. And the resident stepped in and and said something. And if we had if we'd had this conversation beforehand, I would have said, yeah, don't say anything. I'll deal with it. I'll probably just ignore it. But when the resident stepped in and said something, it felt really good to me. And I felt supported. Um, I gave them an opportunity to stand up. And I felt like someone had my back. So keep in mind that if you don't have an opportunity to have the before, conversation, it's almost always going to be better to say something in the situation than to not. So I know that all this is not, none of this is news to all of you, but um, I think it's important to kind of keep going over it over and over again. Um, there, It was kind of news to some folks. So there are some attendings that were not accustomed to having this before conversation. And so I just wanted to share their stories and their feedback. So these are three attendings. It's like a hand that has four fingers. That's because I used to have four attendings. I didn't have time to change the slide. So I'm going to tell you three attendings who did this before step for the first time. Um, and they said they were surprised, they being the learners, were surprised that I was able to address this topic so openly and transparently. They also seemed taken aback to hear that we could address any biases or potential discrimination directly with patients, and I would support them in these interactions. And I'm not going to read the rest of these. I'll maybe give you a couple seconds to read this, and then I'll go on to the third attending. Okay, so I want to pause here and see if folks have any reflections, 
tips or pitfalls on addressing racism and bias? The only thing I have to add, Chum, is that I like to reframe the ignoring comments as a also like taking power and that you still have a you have a choice to say I'm going to ignore this and it's still your choice and you get to decide how you handle it and so I sometimes I won't talk about that explicitly when I'm doing my first like you know, setting expectations for how we're going to address um, racism and bias as a team. But if I'm debriefing something um, or we're talking through it, I just want to highlight how ignoring is 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 still a choice and you can still take power in choosing to ignore something as opposed to it seeming as like, I just, you know, like, ah, this happens to me all the time and I'm just going to ignore it and move on with my day. <laughs> yeah, that that's... Um... That's a really interesting distinction, Katie. Thanks for sharing that. Um, something I've been grappling with is I, I think over time, ignoring these kind of um, you know, racist and biased comments over time, it kind of wears on you. That's why they're called microaggressions sometimes. Um, so what I've been grappling with is like, to what extent should I be suggesting that you know maybe it's not the best thing for you to keep ignoring them, um, but that you know it's a complicated topic, right? And I'm, I'm not really sure if that's my job. I definitely empowering to ignore these kind of comments is. I think that feels like something we should definitely be doing. Um, other thoughts or comments? Is anyone okay? Raise your hand if you're already doing like these pre discussions with your learners. So some, I mean. Yeah, almost everybody. And sorry, I sh maybe I shouldn't have done that. Not to shame folks who haven't been, but it's a potential area that we can all work on. So something to think about. All right. I'm just going to pause. Let's see if I can make myself pause for longer than 10 seconds to see if there's other thoughts. Yeah, I guess I just want to also echo that idea of Katie's of like giving the learner the uh option of ignoring so i actually with every single person during the beginning explicitly asked them if they obviously we can't anticipate every single potential situation that the learner might be in that you know that inappropriate or hateful speech or whatever it may be um but i always try to get a yes or no of if something like this happens would you prefer if i intervene and say something or would you rather that I try to just diminish it and um, we can talk about it later because I, I feel like otherwise I'm always left questioning whether like oh does this person actually want me to like step in is me trying to step in going to actually make them feel more uncomfortable um, so I don't know. yeah no that's great that's great I mean there's I think probably multiple ways to do this well. Um, but I think the one thing that's not um, variable is having a conversation in the first place about it. All right, cool. So let's keep going. Okay. So, that was all to do with learning climate. And so it's what, 1240, we have 20 minutes left and we talked about learning climate. I think that's right, that's kind of the point. And I, uh, if there's one thing to remember as a teacher, it's like psychological safety and learning climate is the most important part. All right, control session, session as I already kind of talked about, has to do with the focus and pacing of the session. Um, it would be poor control of session if I went until 1.30 or even 105, or in some cases, 101, because you all got have things to do, and I said we were gonna finish at one. So that's the most important thing that I think about in control of session, is did you, did you cover everything you wanted to cover in the time that you allotted to cover it? And I, the checklist item that goes along with control of session is ask someone to watch you teach at least one. There is a There are a lot of things that you, probably do not know about what you do unless someone tells you. 
So some of the things I've learned when folks have observed me is that if I say, oh, this will take a minute, like this is in particular in the clinical teaching setting, setting, and I'm like in the hallway with the team, I'm like, all right, let me just talk about this for a minute. That's going to be five minutes. And so, I mean, I have two choices. Well, maybe three choices. I can either say less or I can say it's going to be five minutes. And I don't remember what the third choice is, but I got to do something different, right? You can't say this will take a minute and spend five minutes talking. Um, something else, other feedback I got, lengthy historical digressions. I mean, I think it's fun. Not everybody thinks it's fun. So can I keep that in mind? I, I don't know that I would have realized it unless someone told me. Um, some of the times I've tried to be funny because I'm nervous. When I'm nervous, I try to be funny. And like this is more like classroom teaching kind of stuff. It doesn't always land the way I think. And someone gave me feedback on that once, and it was super helpful. So sometimes when I'm teaching from notes now, it'll say like, "Don't be, don't try to be funny at the top." Um, so I guess I'm this is pretty meta because I'm guess I'm trying to be funny right now. All right. So anyone um, observe someone else and give given them feedback that's been helpful to them. Guess that's hard to know. That was like a two two pronged question. Has anyone yes. observed and given feedback? Luke, go ahead. During this is a little bit different, but um, when we were in residency, we had to observe our colleagues uh, in clinic um, and give feedback to them, which was I found actually a lot more challenging than anticipated because I didn't necessarily uh, agree or like what they were doing, but most of it was just style of different from my own and not that my own style is better. It's just different in what I'm comfortable mm -hmm. with. And I think that that is a um, hard thing to differentiate style from what is actually effect, like quote unquote good. Um, but that's part of that's, I guess that's why always being open to receiving the feedback is so important, but it's hard yeah. to give good feedback is essentially the take home. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great observation. And um, and I think that's why a framework is really important. And the Stanford framework is a good framework to use to give feedback and kind of say, oh, under learning climate, I noticed you kept yelling at the students. You know, that's not good for the learning climate, even though that's your style. You know, so you can make it more objective, I think, um, if you use a, a, mental, a shared mental model on a framework. All right. So communication of goals, this is one of the um, elements that I'm going to give you a little bit more data about, but it's kind of like, do they know what they're supposed to be getting out of it? What are the learning objectives? What is the point of what we're doing? Sharing objectives, even if it's like that one minute in the hall, like at the end of this minute, I just want you to say, what are the three labs you're going to send on every patient with hyponatremia? That really helps learners focus on what they should be attending to. And so this um, author, John Hattie, did a huge meta, it's like a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, over 800 meta-analyses related to, to learning outcomes. And one of the teaching um, uh, styles or teaching behaviors that is most effective is setting goals and difficult goals turn out turns out difficult goals are even better than do your do your best or achievable goals like stretch goals are really effective um, and so you can see here this is the effect size of the intervention so setting a goal and these are high effects from an intervention so I just want to keep the slide up for a minute to really ingrain the idea that goal setting, objective setting is a very important way that you can um, further learning. Okay, understanding and retention now. This is what I talked about earlier is explaining. Are they going to remember it? Are you organized? Are you using visual aids? Are you using take home points? And so the checklist item here is reinforce the take-home point. So if you 
thought about like these are the labs that um, you need to send every time the patient has hyponatremia, or these are the urine labs. At the end of the day, reinforce it maybe. In the middle of the day, reinforce it. Or even at the end of that one minute, reinforce it. Reinforcing the take home point is a powerful way to make learners retain what you're trying to teach them. So the picture here is of Pat Fleet. He was a nephrology course um, leader back when I was in medical school. And I will never forget the talk he gave about ATN. And he was like, muddy brown cast, ATN, muddy brown cast, ATN. And he showed this slide of muddy brown cast. And that better be correct because I'm never going to forget muddy brown cast, ATN ever. So reinforce the take home point. The one thing I want you to take away from the end of the session is, and what do you think it is for this session? What's the one thing I want you to take away? Be kind. Be kind. Yeah. Learning climate, psychological safety. So I guess that's, no, that is one thing. That's one concept. Being kind. That's the most important thing. Um, okay. Evaluation feedback, as I touched on already, is about assessing the learners and providing feedback on um, what your perception is of their knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So what, what all do you think I've done effectively for evaluation and feedback so far today in this little talk, 48 minutes so in? If you were giving me feedback on evaluation and feedback, what would you say? So it's kind of getting kind of meta here, I guess. I would say she has addressed the learning point this point by point. Okay. Have I ha, how have I done evaluation though, Ramayas? Have, have I been able the answer could be I haven't done it. Have I been able to assess your understanding of what I'm trying to teach you? Uh well what I mean is uh, this were under your teaching points and you are going through them one point by point. How can I implement this in uh, in our teaching session, in our checklist. Okay. I think at the end of each one, it seems like you're asking us for our observations. And so in a way, I think you're checking to see what we've taken home based on what we've oh, reflected yeah. on. Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I guess I have been doing it. So that's kind of a, like, I mean, I, I, I thought of it as like trying to engage with you, but part of it is if, you're saying something that's not quite what I'm trying to say or explain. I guess that's evaluation and feedback. All right, cool, I'm doing it. Um, so setting the stage for feedback is um, another one of these checklist items. I think giving feedback is important. Even more important is to make sure that you've set the stage. And a couple of you already alluded to this. I mean, if I don't do this at the beginning of a time working with a, a learner, I'm going to be in trouble when it comes time to give feedback or to do their evaluation. So it's like asking, what are you working on that I can observe and coach on? Is there a goal for, are you working on something that you want to improve on? I can coach. And if it's something like I'm trying to get better presentations, then trying to like inspect that a little bit, like what about the presentation? Are you working on? What is it that you're trying to make better? And then this last sentence is super important. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we always do feedback for everyone. If you don't say something like this, and then at the end you're like, okay, let's do some feedback, it's gonna always feel like, oh, I did something wrong. Um, they must have something they need to tell me. So telling them ahead of time, I think is really, really important. And so back to the meta-analysis. Feedback, even a higher effect size, it reinforces things for the learners. It gives constructive and reinforcing feedback, relating the feedback to the goals that you already defined at the beginning with setting the stage is much more impactful. And um, I think checking in on, well, what do you think you're gonna do differently as a result of this feedback? That is also highly effective for learning. So the checklist item is always set the stage for feedback. It just takes a couple sentences. 
Okay, self-directed learning is the last item in the seven item framework, fostering motivation and use of resources. So this has to do with the individual's needs and goals and interests, and will they continue to learn? Like I said, what you're teaching them and what you're able to teach them is gonna be a teeny tiny slice of what they need to know to be a doctor. The majority of that pie is gonna be filled out by them with their self-motivated and self-directed learning. So how might you, here's another question for you all, how might you foster self-directed learning or motivate self-directed learning in your learners, whether it's in clinic or in the wards or in a classroom teaching situation? Demonstrating that you do it yourself? Yeah, modeling. That's that's pretty powerful. I mean, I guess I don't know for sure, but I feel like that's a pretty powerful way to motivate self-directed learning. Luke, do you have an example of when you've done this? Can you think of a time that this has been like a, a way that you've tried to teach self-directed learning? Um, I don't know. I think it kind of just comes up organically on like rounds and things where you people have a question and no one knows the answer to it. And I think also being having the humility to be like, I also don't know the answer to this. Like, I'll, I will make sure that I go look this up later and then actually following through with that. Yeah, great example. Um, other thoughts on how to um, motivate self-directed learning? Uh, giving reference materials. Say that again, Ramayas? Uh, <clears throat> providing some reference materials on a subject matter. Yeah, right, exactly. So it's like showing how you do it, um, you look stuff up. So how do you look it up? So you might go to UpToDate, you might get other reference materials. So demonstrating. So I think modeling um, the behavior, modeling being vulnerable, demonstrating how you actually do it, um, other ways might be reinforcing the heck out of it when someone does it. If a student actually brings you something, reinforcing that um, goes a long ways. Um, I had something else, but I can't remember. There's like another tip that I give on self-directed learning. But I think the key thing here is it's not attending directed learning. It, it can't be like Luke with that learner who asks the question, you don't know the answer. It can't be like, go look it up you know, report back. That's not modeling self-directed learning. That's telling someone to look it up and that's not gonna help them be motivated in the future to do the learning themselves. All right, so these were the objectives and we're now on to the third objective, which is to employ one new skill to maximize learning. And so let's end with that. If you can take a...